too was going to start with a happy new year, but Scott has already beat me to that and done it with much more enthusiasm than I would have done. So uh, I'll just bypass that. I know uh, some of you are expecting me to make other comments because you've been talking to me about it all morning. I try my best to keep it out of the service, but you don't seem to want me to do that. And so uh, I will just say, in fact, look at the front of your bulletin. You pass over the front of your bulletin. These are stock photos, so we don't do these. We just download them. But what does it say there? It says, start the year with Jesus. And I'm going to say to you, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. <laughs> and, and I'm not talking about football. I'm going to come back to that at the end because my desire is not for you to start the year with Jesus. Anybody can do that. I mean, we're just a few hours into the new year, and so if I were to say to you, have you kept your resolutions, have you achieved your goals, have you done all of those things that you wanted to change this year, you would think I was crazy because we're only a few hours in. I mean, all of us can keep resolutions for half a day. And so it's not about starting the year with Jesus, though we do want to do that, but it's about staying with Jesus throughout the year. It's about us walking with Jesus, not just for the first Sunday of the year, but for all of the year. Now, I'm going to start a new, se a new series next week on the Sermon on the Mount. That is Matthew 5 through 7. I did not want to start it today because I assumed there was going to be a lot of people still out of town and still not here, though I am encouraged by how many are here this morning. So thank you for starting the year in church and I will encourage you also to continue to do that for the rest of the year. But next week, we will start the Sermon on the Mount. But this morning, we are going to focus on what we normally focus on in a new year. Those goals, those resolutions, those changes that we want to make in our lives and in ourselves. Now, in order to do this, we tend to reflect upon the previous year. That is, we look back at some point over the last few weeks over what has transpired in our lives over the last year. Some of you may post those things on social media, sort of a, a recollection of things that transpired over the year. But more than just pictures, we sort of take stock of what the year was. And then we look forward today, in spite of the song that we just sang, we look forward today to think about a new year. And we think about the plans we have for a new year, the changes we want to make, the decisions that we know are going to be necessary in order to bring those changes about. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about those kinds of decisions that are going to impact the future that we have. And we're actually going to do it from a, a negative example. Now, I'm not trying to be negative this morning. The new year is always filled with hope, so I'm not trying to bring us down. But we're going to look at a negative example from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 13, as the Israelites make some very poor decisions over the course of time that greatly impact their relationship with God. And from their negative example, I hope we can learn to make the opposite kinds of choices, the right kinds of choices, certainly not in every circumstance, but more often than not so that we can have in the new year a renewed you. I know most of us want that. Most of us want a, a new year to be better than the last year. And so I want to start the year off by talking about how we can learn from their negative example so that we can make positive choices and we can have a renewed you in the new year. So let me start by asking you, are you satisfied with your life? See, that's the kind of question we pose to ourselves when we start a new year. I, I'm not asking, are you satisfied with what you have in life? I'm not asking you if you're satisfied with where you are in life. I'm asking you, are you satisfied with, with life? And I think if many of us were honest, we'd have to say that satisfaction is not the word that readily comes to mind. We might even say that Really, we, we might have to say that we're just trying to survive life. I survived the holidays. I survived all of the, the get-togethers. 
And now I'm going to relax for a few days, but then tomorrow or Tuesday, based on your work schedule, you're going to go back to that same job that doesn't bring you satisfaction. And you're going to work that same job so that you can make some more money to buy you more things that also don't bring you satisfaction. And we're just going to keep that wheel turning. Henry David Thoreau famously said, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. I hope you don't identify with that quote. I hope you can better identify, not with Henry David Thoreau, but with Jesus Christ who said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So are you experiencing an abundant, satisfying life or with Thoreau, a life of quiet desperation? Probably most of us are somewhere in between on that continuum. But today I want to look at this passage of Scripture so that we can make better choices in the new year, so that we can be renewed in our relationship with the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning verse 9. Therefore I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children I will contend. For cross to the coast of Cyprus and sea. Or send to Kadar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. I want you to keep your Bibles open because we are going to reference some previous verses here, and I want you to see, uh, especially in this first point, where we're going to be talking about the background to a poor decision. We're going to see their background to where they got to the point in the verses that we just read. And there is little doubt here that the Israelites made a bad decision in forsaking God for idols. But the question we want to start with is, how did they get there? What's the background for this poor decision? Well, look at verse 2. In verse 2, God says, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. You see, the situation they were in in verses 9 through 13 is because they had made bad choices along the way, bad decisions, but it didn't start out that way. They weren't in this situation for a lack of previous devotion. In fact, there was a time in their lives when they knew God, when they loved God, and when they lived in obedience to God. Jeremiah cites the the wilderness time period, and most of you know that time period, those 40 years in in the wilderness before they went into the promised land. And we tend to think of that, and rightfully so, based on other books in the Old Testament, we tend to think of that as a time of great disobedience of the Israelites, and there was a lot of that. We tend to focus on the grumbling and the complaining and the wanting to go back to Egypt, and all of those things did occur, but Jeremiah tells us that was also a time of growth in their life. A time when at some aspects of that 40 years, they were devoted to the Lord and they loved the Lord and wanted to follow him. They were growing closer to him as they grew closer to entering the promised land. And so Jeremiah compares this time in their life to the love shared between a bride and a groom. And you know that at a wedding. You you can see it on the faces of the bride and groom. It's It's there in the spoken words that are said, not only in the ceremony, but before and after. I mean, there's just no doubt when you go to a wedding that here are two people who are in love, and that is why they are getting married. I do weddings occasionally, of course, and as all of us here are required to do as ministers, we give premarital counseling before we do a wedding ceremony, and so I I, I use one of the sessions that I do to talk about love. And and I try to explain to them what true love is to the best of my knowledge, certainly not that I'm an expert, but I try to explain to them that this is something they're going to have to work on throughout their marriage because it doesn't just happen. 
And so I even start talking to them about, about guarding their hearts and lives. Because I say to them, at some point in the future, there are going to be temptations and you need to have some guardrails in your life and, and some guards in your heart so that you don't fall prey to temptation or someone else. And they look at me like I'm crazy. They look at me like they have no idea what I'm talking about because sometimes they'll even say to me, that you don't have to worry about that with us. We're in love. You got to understand, we love each other and we have eyes for no one else. And I realize at that moment they're telling the truth, but I also realize that that can fade over time. And I realize that things do come into marriages that can destroy that, that relationship. And that is why I warned them at the very beginning. Spiritually, we can fall into that same trap. Think back to when you began your relationship with the Lord. Think back to that time in your life when you were converted, when you first came to know him and be saved. It was an exciting time. It was a time when you were filled with love for the Lord, a time when you were readily obedient to him. The question in those days were not, are you going to be obedient? You just needed to know what to do. As long as someone would tell you what you're supposed to do, you'd be obedient because you were excited about your new walk with Christ. But sadly, sometimes, sometimes, somewhere along the way, we begin to settle down. We lose that excitement. We get into our routines. Our hearts can actually grow cold and our obedience stale. And then we wake up one day wondering why our lives don't hold the promise that it once did when we first came to Jesus. You remember what Jesus said to one of the churches, the church in Ephesus, in those famous passages in the book of Revelation where he talks to the seven churches? He lists what was going on in Ephesus and they were doing a lot of good things. But then he said, but this I have against you. You have left your first love. They were doing a lot of good things spiritually or religiously, a lot of exterior things that looked good, but Jesus said, you've left your first love. And as a result, he had some harsh things to say to them. And I'm simply wondering at the outset this morning if as we start a new year, that might be possible of us. Even as we gather this morning on the first day and the first Sunday of a new year, that in our hearts it might be possible that we've wandered away just a little bit. There's a second aspect to their background here. Verse 8, they had also experienced priestly desert desertion. I mean, in verse 8, there are four segments of spiritual leadership that are listed, and all of them have deserted the Lord. The priests, whose job it was to sacrifice to the Lord on behalf of the people, Jeremiah says, are not even seeking the Lord themselves. The scribes, those are the men that we would say in the New Testament, the word's not found there, but we would equate those to the scribes in the New Testament whose job it was to, to record the law, to write it down, to copy the law so that people knew it. And they were apparently still doing that. They were still doing their job, but they weren't doing it with any kind of love or devotion to God's laws. In other words, they were mechanically going through the motions without any real relationship with God. And I know for a fact we can get like that. We, of course, have done this for several years now, but we are encouraging you to read the Bible through, doing a little bit of a different, uh, different version this year, a, a chronology that is a, a timeline, not just straight through. But you know as well as I do that there are times when we can check off that box when we did read Genesis 1 through 3 this morning, and so we checked it off that we read the Bible today. But 30 minutes later, if someone were to ask us what we read, we might not have much of any idea. Because while we're doing what we were supposed to do, we were just doing it going through the motions. That's what he says here about the leaders in Israel. And then there's a term there for the fact that they were just generally speaking in rebellion. We might use the term pastors here of the local churches. Again, that word's not found in our text, but we might equate it to that. They were living in sin and disobedience, not seeking the Lord. And it doesn't take long in our modern day to search on Google and find that this thing, same thing continually happens more times than any of us would like to see. 
That over and over again, we hear of a prominent pastor or spiritual leader who has fallen into sin. Nobody knew about it for a long time, but it has finally been revealed. And they've been living a double life and no one knew about it. And while we might be shocked when those Google searches come back, it's really nothing new. Because that's exactly what Jeremiah was saying was happening here in the days of Israel. Finally, he says there that even the Lord's prophets were working for Baal rather than Yahweh. The very prophets that were supposed to be speaking to the people on behalf of God were actually servants of Baal. And so what we have here is a total picture of rebellion. Not only the people, but the people were merely following their leaders. That doesn't undermine their responsibility for what was going on, but Jeremiah understood the value of leadership, and he knew that when the leaders desert the Lord, it's quite possible that the people will naturally follow. All of this is a reminder that we are not immune to this danger. None of us, no matter how long we've been a Christian, no matter how long we have faithfully served, no matter how much devotion we've had in the past, we are not immune to drifting away from the Lord. I know you wouldn't do it intentionally. I mean, you wouldn't be here this morning if if you were going to renounce the Lord tomorrow. I get that. But we can do it slowly and wake up one day and not even realize how we got there. So what's the effect of all of this? That's the background to a poor decision. What happens when, when this happens? What is the effect of this poor decision? What took place in their lives as a result? And what can we learn from their poor example? Well, first of all, we see in verse 9 that they had experienced a broken fellowship with God. What appears to be a very harsh statement there is really just a, a statement of fact. God was in a covenant relationship with the Israelites, and they had broken that covenant, but God would not. Now, that does not mean that there was no effect. That's what we're talking about here. Their relationship with God may not have changed, but their fellowship certainly did. They could not enjoy the relationship they had with God because their fellowship was broken, and every parent knows that. Every parent knows that our relationship with our children is not destroyed by their sin or disobedience, but oftentimes our fellowship is. We don't enjoy that relationship sometimes because it has been broken through disobedience. The wording here reminds us of legal terms. God was bringing charges against his people, and I'm certain that the evidence was overwhelming and the charges would indeed stick. In fact, he says the charges will continue for generations to come. Now, keep in mind that this does not mean that future generations are held responsible for our sins. This is not a proof text for future generations being responsible for things we do. But it is a reminder that the things we do and the disobedience in our own times does, in fact, impact and affect future generations. It is a weighty matter to think that my fellowship with God, or lack thereof, can have a tremendous influence upon my children. Or beyond that, I don't even have grandchildren yet. But my decisions that I make this year can impact my grandchildren who are not yet even born. And that is a weighty matter to consider that my fellowship with God impacts people who are not yet even born which is yet another reason why it's so important that we make sure we are faithfully following Christ. I don't want you to get confused. You and I cannot lose our relationship with God if it is a genuine relationship. We talk about this all the time. A genuine salvation is not lost through disobedience, but we can lose the joy of such a relationship because sin breaks fellowship with God even as it did here with the Israelites, which again is why David prayed, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When David's fellowship with God was broken through his sin with Bathsheba, and he was finally called on that and confessed, that's what he prayed, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. It's simply one of the many effects of moving away from a previous devotion to Christ. And there's an old hymn that reminds us that this is quite possible. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. And if that happens to us, we will experience a broken fellowship with God. 
Secondly, we notice the effect of this poor decision, and that is they had openly forsaken God, verses 10 and following. They had followed the spiritual example of their leaders, as we have already said. They had openly forsaken God, and now the people had as well. And this was such a horrible betrayal that Jeremiah encourages them to search the nations around them. This is basically a way of saying, look as far to the east as you possibly can, and then look the other way to the west. And I don't know if I'm looking the right way or not, but he's saying, look far to the east and far to the west and see if there's any nation who's who's done what you've done. And the implied answer is there is not. And by the way, he goes on to say their gods aren't even real gods. You've forsaken the true God for gods that don't really exist. Missionaries can account to this fact. Southern Baptist Convention in our mission efforts around the world has certainly learned that it is difficult to go into pagan nations and see people converted to Christ because we run up against generations of ingrained allegiance to false gods that is difficult to penetrate. And yet, Jeremiah says the Israelites had so freely forsaken their God, so easily and quickly turned away from the one true God when no other nation was doing that, and they had pagan gods. Now, is that not what we see in America? Now, I'm not about to go off on what's going on out there in America, because I'm not preaching to America, I'm preaching to us. It's very easy for us to point our fingers and watch the news and say, there's the problem, he's the problem, across the aisle is the problem. But that's not my point this morning, so I'm not about to to go off on what's going on in America. My focus is is us this morning. And so when it says there, uh, the nations, or our nation, or the nation, referring to Israel, I'm thinking about us as individuals, us as a corporate body. And we see over and over again, generation after generation, it seems, and it's getting worse and worse, moving further away from the foundations of true Christianity. Surveys are consistently telling us this in America, that less and less people are going to church, less and less people are identifying as Christians, that more and more people are saying they have no belief in God whatsoever. And we've certainly seen it in our own churches, where it is extremely difficult to get teenagers, once they've graduated from high school, to continue to faithfully come to church. The numbers are staggering and tragic. Of the young people who are raised in the church, who have now walked away from that faith, in spite of perhaps our best efforts at raising them in the body of Christ. And yet when they get old enough to make their own decisions, the time when we're no longer forcing them to come with us, they so easily turn away. Again, this is another reason why we must be consistent in our walk with the Lord, why we must be faithful in following Christ so we can give them the example that they need. Now, you might say to yourself, but I haven't forsaken God. I'm here. And again, I agree with you. I don't think you have necessarily. I'm not making that claim, but I am saying it's possible for us to be on that path. And that path is progressive, Because they not only forsook God, they then embraced falsehood. Verse 8, they they embrace things that do not profit. Some of your translations use the word idols there. It's not the regular word for idol, and that's why the ESV doesn't use that word. But it's worthless or profitless things. In verse 11, it says much the same thing. The word glory there is actually translated or capitalized, I should say, in some versions because many commentators believe it is a reference to God himself, that the people had turned away from God and they had embraced things that were worthless. And here it is that we can breathe a sigh of relief or so we think. We're not idolaters. We don't embrace or worship idols. We don't have carvings or statues in our home. And therefore, this doesn't apply to us. Unless we understand the definition of an idol, and the true definition of an idol is anything or anyone who takes priority over our relationship with God. And if that's our definition of an idol, then we can quickly see that we can become idolaters. I think I told you sometime last year, that I had sort of outlined a sermon series. I haven't done it yet. Don't know if I ever will, but 
Sometimes I just brainstorm and try to come up with things that I want to preach in the future, but one of the things that I had written down was a, was a series on contemporary idols. And I didn't spend days or weeks thinking or praying about this. I just wrote down what, what I thought were some contemporary idols, and I looked back at that list. Pleasure is certainly on that list. Whatever form that might take, and we won't get into that this morning, but whatever form pleasure might take, we could certainly say that it is a contemporary idol in our country and among our people. Power, popularity, possessions or finances, politics, prestige, people. Those were just the P's I could think of. I mean, I could probably go to other letters of the alphabet and come up with a lot more. My point is that idolatry is alive and well, and we must guard against it. But we see here that it is inherently worthless when it is compared to God. So anything and anybody can become an idol. We can turn a relationship into an idol, whether that relationship is a spouse or a child or a grandchild. Certainly our pursuit of wealth and possessions is a common idol in America, and we need to be reminded what James says in his little letter, that the love of money can corrupt us. We are reminded of what Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet uses his, loses his own soul? And Jeremiah is basically saying the same thing here. He's telling us it is not profitable, it is in fact destructive. And that is why we must guard against not only forsaking God, but then embracing falsehood as well. And when I say embracing falsehood, we need to be reminded that this can take place in our heart where nobody else can see. Because again, we don't have those statues in our homes. We're not bowing down to an idol, but those idols can be hidden in our hearts where no one else knows about them. Sometimes maybe even we don't. But we saw over the course of December that God does. Remember what he said when Nathaniel showed up? Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, which is a way of saying that Jesus knew his heart, which is why Nathaniel made that great statement that he made. And then we saw in the last of those three sermons that he must increase, but we must decrease. That's essentially what I'm saying again this morning. He must be the priority in our life because if God is not our priority, something else or someone else will be. If God is not number one, someone else or something else will be. That becomes an idol. Now we've forsaken God and we've embraced falsehood, which is why we must come back to priority number one. Now, I said at the outset, We were going to try to learn from this negative example so that we don't make the same mistake. So I want to conclude by giving us a a two-stage formula for making the right decisions. Consistently following this will help us. I'm not saying these are the answers for everything, but these two statements will help us become a renewed you. So number one, don't substitute the material for the spiritual. The picture we have here in verse 14 is a beautiful picture. It's a powerful picture. Water was a necessity of life then and now. Some of you figured that out this past week because you had pipes burst in your home and suddenly much of your daily activity could not be done merely because you did not have water. We had to, we had to close our daycare for a couple of days because we had a pipe burst We couldn't operate daycare without water. We had to allow, well, had to allow is not the best way to say it, but we we did allow Minot's Funeral Home to use our sanctuary all week long for their funerals because they had a pipe burst and they had flooded over there. And so they're our neighbors and we let them have use of our facilities. All that to remind us that water is a necessity of life. And in those days, in the days of Jeremiah, you couldn't just turn the faucet on anytime you wanted it and get water. What they wanted was fountains, fountains that are fed by springs. That was the, the best alternative. Then these fountains offered an ongoing supply of water. And it was fresh and it was clean and it was continually flowing. And God pictures himself as that. 
In fact, Jesus himself said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Jesus used that picture very much like Jeremiah does, and he says that out of you will flow rivers of living water when you stay with me. But the trouble in Jeremiah's day was that they had forsaken this fresh supply of water for man-made cisterns. Now, a cistern was a collection trough. So you, some of you have been to Israel, you know it's a very dry climate. And so when it did rain, which wasn't very often, they would try to collect the rain. And they would collect the rain in these cisterns, especially where there were no fresh water supply available. But it was never the greatest alternative because it would always leak. They had forsaken the fountain of living water and they had hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And how foolish that was for them and how foolish it is for us that we forsake the spiritual and try to find satisfaction in the material. That in spite of what the Bible says, we continue to think that we can find life in other things rather than God. And that's what that picture is about, making cisterns and forsaking the living water. And then it goes on to say that we ought not to substitute the temporal for the eternal. It doesn't say that in those words, but as I mentioned a moment ago, one of the inherent problems with cisterns was they leaked. They would, they would put a line, a lining on the porous limestone rocks of Palestine with some sort of plaster in an effort to hold the water, but inevitably there would be leaks. And even if there weren't leaks, these cisterns could become stagnant. And you know what this looks like because you've been by, we live in the south, so you've been by ponds that don't have water constantly flowing to them. And sometimes those ponds, like the duck pond in Fountain City, get nasty on the top, right? I mean, it just gets awful looking. And so if the cistern did hold water for a long period of time, it could start looking like that. That's the same problem we encounter when we substitute for God in our search for satisfaction. We look at those things we talked about earlier thinking that they will provide uh, satisfaction for us, and for a while they do. I mean, the Bible even says that sin is pleasurable for a season. So whatever your idol is, if it's money, it might satisfy for a while, but you know how much more you need, right? You always need more. I think it was Rockefeller that was asked how much more money did he need, and his answer was just a little more. Because if money is your idol, you'll always want more. If pleasure is your idol, you will always need a higher high. And you can fill in that same equation with any idol that we mentioned or any other that you could think of. Because the only one that will truly satisfy is the one who created us. And the one who redeemed us. Because he created us to have a relationship with him and to find that satisfaction in life through him. Again, that's why Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so we go back to the initial question. I mean, what kind of changes are you thinking about making this year? What kind of decisions are you going to need to make in order for you to have a renewed you? The priority is not diets. Nothing wrong with that. I intend to do that as well. But that's not the priority. The priority priority is not our health. The priority is not our possessions or profit. Our priority is not the bucket list of events that we think we need to accomplish before we leave this earth. The priority is Christ, right? That's what we saw in the month of December. We heard John the Baptist say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, We heard Nathaniel say, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then we went back to John the Baptist as a response. And we heard John the Baptist say, he must increase, but I must decrease. And those were not slogans that I wanted you to memorize just for a month. Those are mindsets, attitudes that I want us to have for the entire year. So going back to the bulletin, I don't want you to start the year with Jesus. 
Anybody can do that. I want you to stay true to Jesus throughout the year. Not forsake him for idols, whatever the stripe might be. Not embrace falsehood, but remain true to Christ, both today and for the rest of your life. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you that we have the, the privilege of the hope of starting a new year, and yet, in another sense, we know it's just the turning of a page on the calendar. But I pray that you would help us to examine our lives this morning and the days to come, that we would uh, prioritize you in our lives, that nothing would supplant you, that you would indeed be priority number one in our lives, both for today and for the rest of our lives. Because that's the only way we're going to find satisfaction. That's the only way we're going to be renewed in our relationship with you. And so I pray that when we begin to stray in thought or in deeds from that path, that you would remind us that you are the fountain of living water, that you are the source of satisfaction for our lives and that we need to stay true to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing and you respond.